be a little bit different. To, oh, okay. Here we go. Here we go. Uh, the Hogsits are here. Hey, how you doing? Hey, good. Yeah, we how went into three bottles already. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I've been the, napping preparing for this evening. <laughs> Your wife only two bottles, I know. <laughs> oh, yeah. Been one you of those days. More, huh? <laughs> <laughs> right, so, um, did you start yet? Yes. Oh, you did. Okay, great. Well, <laughs> welcome everybody to tonight's tasting. This is Elizabeth Beaudray and Jeff Beaudray, the owners of Tipples Brews and Wines, welcoming you to another one of our weekly wine tasting. This week, we're going to be drinking the delightful Bordeaux Rouge, uh, Chateau Tour Prignoc. Uh, from uh, the, uh, it's from the Medoc region, which we'll cover uh, within Bordeaux. Uh, 91 point rating from wine enthusiast, fantastic uh, wine. Actually, awesome. we'll discuss later on, but actually, um, this is the Cru Bourgeois, which is one of the designations within France of what type of wine this is. And we'll see why that tends to create a lot of good ratings, uh, but we'll talk about that later on. So um, in the meantime, let's get right into it. Uh, as I like to say, um, after the intro, let's open some wine. If you haven't already, pop it open and pour. I like to chill it down to about 65 degrees. That's 30 minutes in the refrigerator before you uh, open it. The French reds are a little bigger, tighter, bolder wine. And so they could, they will evolve significantly while we taste the wine. So as we talk about this over the next 30 minutes, you will notice changes in your wine tonight. I know we've noted that in different wines in the past, but tonight I think you will really, really notice quite a big difference. Hmm, this wine is uh, fantastic. Uh, everything, reds from Bordeaux are always red, uh, red blends with varietals that are dominantly Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, then you get into some of the Petit Verdot and Malbecs and so a few other varietals. Uh, tonight, what we're going to be drinking is dominantly Merlot and Cabernet Sauvignon. The pairings for this would be um, a black pepper steak, pork roast, kind of heavy pork dishes, mm -hmm. maybe some ribs. Filet mignon would be great, beef brisket, buffalo burgers, um, My mouth started watering. <laughs> 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 the minute Anything. you mentioned the filet, I was like, oh, yes. Oh, right. <laughs> Anything that moves. Yeah, absolutely. Some venison. <laughs> uh, you can go with sharp cheeses. So, and then vegetables, you know, like roast potatoes, lentils, mushrooms, any of those roasty, delicious things. Oh, that is really lovely. It really is yeah, fantastic. <laughs> It's a, I'm going, to, I'm going to start with the color. It's a really beautiful dark ruby. Actually, when we took the cork out tonight, Jeff said, right. look at how dark that is. This right. is going to be fantastic. Right. You see that? It's almost black. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it it's, is. It's a beautiful, just intensely so dark, dark crimson. Purple, yeah. Mm -hmm. right. We don't say crimson in this house. Oh, sorry. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> we could say garnet. <laughs> <laughs> Um, one of the wonderful things about French winemaking is French winemaking utilizes oak in the barrel to enhance what you get out of the earth. And I think that shows right on the nose immediately if we're going to talk about that. It's, uh, it's not immediately about vanilla and dill. It's actually kind of a spice along with earthiness. Uh, and actually, and I'm talking about the other thing, uh, kind of a, a well-structured, spicy, earthy, uh, mm -hmm. black cherry. Um, I wouldn't go into plum at this place. Uh, at, at this point, it's not, it's not as rich as that. Mm. Give it a sip. Mm. Oh. This is really good. <laughs> That's a beautiful wound up beast. This is really good. I, I mean, I like it. Other people could have different opinions, which you can right. share. And, right. and, and we'll, we'll talk about it. What you're tasting right now will, like I said, it will change. Um, right now it's, it's kind of wound up tight. You've got some nice tannins and I'm getting a bit of a, uh, a bit of a uh, cranberry effect along with the cherry on the fruit side that will loosen up 
and I think it will actually open up quite a bit more and you'll end up with more cherries and herbs. Hmm. Tell me when you want me to share the slides. Okay, uh, let's talk, head on over to the slide and I'll keep talking about a bit more of what we're tasting and then we'll go into why. It's not sharing. There we go. There we go. All right, so here we are. Uh, when we look at France, this is the same map we used last week because last week we were drinking Chablis from up here. And this week we're running over here to the Bordeaux region. And specifically, we are on the what's called the left bank uh, of the, trying to get there, the Garonne River. <laughs> So left bank and right bank, and we are going to, I wonder if I can just It's do it this interesting because it look, the left bank has, it, it's marked, or at least, okay, the colors are only for the winemaking areas, right? So right. where it's white, there's no wine. Right. It looks like that, like northern right side doesn't have any at the top. Right it, yeah. From, yeah. Well, you, you would be huh. right. Well, and the reason for that is um, this area actually mm -hmm. has less protection from the ocean breezes and it's just too chilly uh, to it's ripen. Too exposed. Yep. Mm -hmm. How do I move forward? Can I do that? Did you click? Yeah. I did. So we have no mouse this time because we have a, uh, a microphone yeah, plugged so. in. So it's a little bit of a different thing today. So, and hopefully the microphone works really well. I hope yeah. you're all hearing us well. <laughs> So here we are. Uh, this is uh, so here we are zooming into just the Bordeaux region. All of this is Bordeaux. And so we have the left bank, which is traditionally known for Cabernet Sauvignon dominant red blends. The right bank is known for more uh, from, for Merlot dominant red blends. And then the Entre du Mer is a little bit of everything along with some of the sweet wines and actually the white sweet wines, which we mm. should drink one of those sometime, mm -hmm. um, are from down in here near the, uh, the, the southernmost part. Brian votes for that. <laughs> okay. Sautern is a beautiful, beautiful wine. So, and then we'll look here. So we're sticking to the left bank, which is where we're featuring tonight. Um, this is the Medoc region up here, which is where we are drinking tonight. The green area. The green area. And, oh, look at that. Well, that was weird. And so uh, then this area, we see that dot right there. I don't even know how I made that move, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> this is specifically where we are, th this is the vineyard that we're drinking from. It's right there. So we'll come back to that in a little bit. Uh, the uh, Chateau Tour Prignoc. What are your thoughts so far? i just give you a quick introduction to Bordeaux and where we're drinking. Everyone en enjoying the wine, not enjoying the wine? I'm enjoying it. It's getting better. I, I wasn't quite sure to begin with, but I could definitely smell the, smell the earthy tones. Mm. Yeah, my that's a very, very good point. Yep. Yeah, my first sip, I was just like, uh-oh. I have not let this air out long enough, um, but my second sip was tremendously better. The, um, I think it's like really cherry, um, mm -hmm. and yeah, like I said, like kind of earthy. Um, uh, maybe a little bit of clove, but like, I'm not sure. The um, their, their aftertaste is super weird though. Um, like, I think it's like really, really good, and it like comes to a complete stop, if that makes sense. Mm. It may yeah, depend on the temperature of your wine as it warms up because um, yeah. the, fin the finish mm -hmm. is going to be dependent on that. I, I don't know. Have, did you chill yours down a little bit, Chris? Yeah, I added, we put, we put it in the fridge about an hour ago, opened it 15 minutes ago. I actually put it back in the fridge because of this because I was like, I'm going to get it leaving like a little bit cooler and let it air a little bit longer. Right. But um, yeah, I think it has like a super sharp like finish rather than this sort of like nice, you know. It's, um, it is not going to be the velvety vanilla oak finish that we're used to from red blends in the United States. That's not the style of the French winemakers. And that is kind of why I wanted to feature this wine because we had that, that really nice um, red blend called Angels and Cowboys from the, yeah. uh, 
from the Sonoma uh, region, which is that, it, and I called it like a, a hug from California. It's that rich, velvety. Uh, a, they have a very aggressive barrel um, barrel effect on those wines, which gives you that that vanilla roundup on there. And what we have here is uh, the French version, where they really want the terroir to sh shine through no matter what. And in this case, when you on the finish here, what I'm getting is kind of an a combination of the herbs from the uh, from the terroir. So a bit of uh, kind of a nice green herb combined with the spiciness. The spiciness is all from the barrel, but we're talking about rather neutral to um, delicate barrel effect. And then the um, it's playing around with the uh, the cherry of the uh, of the grape itself, which is as it warms up and as it opens, I think, and I'm already seeing it. The yeah. cranberry is moving toward much more toward mm -hmm. cherry, and then it eventually it will move toward black cherry mm. as it continues to open. Uh, one of the ratings for this thing, as we were looking at, like the 91 point rating from um, from uh, wine enthusiast, he talked about at the end that he thought it would drink well around 2023. But if you looked at the other rating from Wine Spectator, they thought it would be good about 2020. And that goes into what we'll discuss later, which is the variability in wine ratings. So what we are drinking right now is right at the early stage drinking of this really, really pretty wine, which is why it will evolve so much. You give it another five years before you pop open the next one and it will need less evolution. But I kind of enjoy the evolution because you'll drink it and it'll be a little bit of a different wine as you sip through the discussion. And that's one of my favorite parts about wines. So I decided to aerate this after I opened it, um, just to see. And I'll, mm -hmm. I'll say, Chris, if you have a Venturi, try, try aerating the next glass that you have. Yeah, that's what we're doing. Because I was going to say, like, when you were saying that about the finished, I was like, we aren't getting that. Exactly. Uh, right. Same thing, Julie. We're not, I'm not getting Very. that finish. We, we but, I am, but I am tasting a lot more minerally. Right. Jeff, where do you yeah. think that's coming from? Yeah. What, what was that, Harriet? I missed it. The, the mineral. The mineral. I'm getting a yeah, lot of I mineral. agree with that. Definitely um, minerally. All right, so that is based on, that is from the, the soils in this area. And in actually, we can probably go in to start, uh, begin to talk about the soils in here because uh, the, it's an interesting thing when we talk about, as we look at some of the pictures I have, you know, I always like to put pictures of the region. In um, Bordeaux, the, the landscape is not as dramatic as what we've been seeing in Oregon and then in New Zealand and even in Spain with that arid quality. But their, their soils here are incredibly porous and dry. So they just do not hold moisture very well. And so a lot of that, that, um, that, uh, minerality comes into into the um into the grapes so it's a very wet region for wine growing it's actually more wet than you would think would be possible the reason and, and we'll look at the um the map of the world with growing regions and you'll see it's on the kind of uh, and the lower level of what is possible and so it's not so much the climate that allows the uh the excellence of wine grapes in this area it's a combination the climate is a little warmer and moister than it should be, but the soil is so porous that it allows them to uh, grow these, these really fine grapes. Where was the other place that we had that really poor? Was it Spain? Spain was incredibly arid. Okay. So that Spain had the exact opposite effect where, okay. um, where these guys in Bordeaux have to fight against mildew and that kind of a thing, but mm. the, the, the poor soil allows them to save themselves. Spain doesn't have any of those challenges. Okay. Spain is arid and has porous soil. It's actually much easier to grow them there. They're the, more often in Spain, you will see where they can just grow things and let them grow naturally. Mm. And they'll literally just let them do what they will because they don't have to work on it as hard. Whereas in Bordeaux, they really, they really work at their craft in order to create great grapes, but it takes a lot of attention. And that is one of the reasons why Bordeaux generally costs more. Oh, and they have to work so much harder. They do. They have to work much harder to bring these grapes in. But at the same time, it's a combination of factors where they established the norm, if you will, of what mm. wine should taste like because they were the first one to emerge as one of the powerhouses of wine creators in the world. And the fact that they do, do, uh, they do so much work on their, their wines that um, 
they really put their stamp on it. So mm -hmm. when you have, when you find a place that you love in France, they're doing a lot that, a lot of that d does depend on the winemaker. Okay. So okay. one question about that, is that France in general, they established like what wine is supposed to taste like? And so they're all priced higher because of that? Or is it Bordeaux specifically? It's generally, and let's say it's Bordeaux and Burgundy okay. in France. When you come to some of the other areas that are not as well known, like the Loire, Ma the Loire Valley or Languedoc, uh, those are much more reasonably priced and okay. delicious wines. They're fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the soils in the in the Rhone area can be kind of dry and rocky as well. Is that a, is that a similar type soil or are different there? It's it's um it's similar in that it is dry and rocky. It's different in what makes up the soil itself. So yeah. you've got a lot more, um, much like we were talking about with Chablis, where you're talking about um, ancient seabeds. Mm -hmm. That's much more what we're talking yeah. about in in um, Bordeaux, mm -hmm. rather than over in the Rhone, which is these <laughs> these warm, uh, schisty um, uh, rocks and pebbles and that kind of a thing. It's a, it's a different thing where that tends to be more of what was broken down from mountains rather than coming up from the seabed. Uh, more of the shale type of stuff that you see. Right. In other areas of Europe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I remember from our tour in that area. Oh, good. Uh, he speaks the truth. What can I say? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Tasting better as the time goes on here. I, I, this is really tasting better <clears throat> as the time goes on. Just warming oh, up a little bit. because oh, I Oh, good. Cold, so mm -hmm. it is tasting better. Well, and that's one of the things with French reds, um, actually French wines in general, but especially French reds, is um, they do, they can be challenging, but they do open up and they really reward, but they just, they, um, they take a few more minutes and they take a little bit more time than a lot of the, the easy drinking American reds because of um, a combination of uh, tighter, tighter grapes mm -hmm. that are just a little more, they're less ripe when they're, when they are fermented and a little less barrel to make it uh, kind of easy drinking. They, they really oh. wanted, they want to describe where the area is from. They want it to, you, they want you drinking a piece of where they live. So I have two things. I have one just comment. When I first started drinking wine, I didn't think I liked French wines. At all. I didn't like French wines at all because they were so challenging. And I just, I found them just, because I liked the sweeter wines. Mm -hmm. So I just found French wines too challenging and I didn't think that I was ever going to like them, <laughs> mm -hmm. but I've evolved to liking them. And then, ah, oh, there was another thing I was gonna ask you. What was the last thing you said before I talked? <laughs> Do you remember? No. You don't remember no, what no, you I'm, said. I'm, I don't know half of what you said. They're less, they're less ripe than California yeah. was like the last thing. Yeah, with the aggressive, um, ah. Californians have that aggressive oak. Okay, well, when I think of it, I'll ask it. <laughs> okay, so uh, climate in this area, uh, like I mentioned, it, it tends to be kind of cool and moist because it's coming in off the ocean mm -hmm. there. Uh, it is the soils that save it, uh, but that is changing. So where we are, let's jump back over. I remembered what I was gonna say. Okay. So do you want me to ask you now? Or? Sure, go ahead. Okay, so because the French want you to know this is where it comes from. Right. Does it make it easier to identify when you're going through sommelier training, like the French wines and where they're from, because you're doing blind tasting. Yes. So, yes. So the French, you're like, I know this. It, the fact that it's French, mm -hmm. like if you go in, in the early levels, because in the in the in the early part, you're literally just defining what's old world versus new world. Okay. And if they give you a Frenchie, boom. Okay. Yeah. Because <laughs> it's such a you know, it's a very French style, and mm -hmm. uh, and then within that, yes, the when they break down the different areas of France or within Bordeaux, even different areas within Bordeaux, they do legitimately have different tastes, different flavors, different aromas. So what is the one that is the hardest region to identify, like blind tasting geographically? Or do you find them all? No, no. Um, I would say South America can really throw a monkey wrench in the war because South America can taste like France and they can taste like California. <laughs> they are all over the place that and they, they're fantastic. They make mm -hmm. lovely wines, but they can taste so different 
Okay. And even like Argentina, like you would, I would say like um, Chile, for example, Chile tends to taste a little more French. So you might say, okay, I'm tasting France or Chile, depending on what's going on. But you go to Argentina and Argentina does taste a little more new world yes. until they don't. <laughs> 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 they can until they don't. And then the southern part of our Argentina, Patagonia, can taste like Burgundy. <laughs> so, yeah, our, the, the South okay. America is an incredible area to get wine from, mm -hmm. and they can taste like so many different areas of the world. They can, oh, be, yeah. they can really make it confusing. Okay. <laughs> Do you want me to share the thing Yes, now? please. Now that I've interrupted you. Uh, Thank uh, you. No, no. That's, okay. I don't know why it keeps wanting to go back. Okay, so this is uh, so up in the northern Medoc area, right at the river's entrance there. Um, the ocean is up to the left. Uh, this is where this wine is from. And do you want to go to the next one? Yeah, I had it queued for you. Oh, thank you. Okay, so I talked about um, Bordeaux, Left Bank, Medoc. It's not a lot of drama in the landscape. The drama, and they literally said this in the description, the drama comes from the chateaus in the architecture that the French put in around the, <laughs> the area. But actually, if you look down between the rows here, do you guys see the, um, that look of like shells, like yes. we saw in Chablis? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. 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 Do you want to do the thing? Would you oh, like for me to I change? would love you to. Okay. Okay, so here's some of what they're talking about. Just gorgeous place, um, generally pretty flat, you know, for the for the growth of the uh, the vines. But the French, they do it right. I mean, what a what a beautiful place to visit in mm -hmm. its own right. And next one, please. This is actually the chateau that we're drinking from right now, Prignac. So they actually have an interesting background. Um, chateau Prignac began in the 16th century, so we're talking about the 1500s when they began growing grapes in that area, on that particular property. And they sold them off, they were not winemakers until um, around 1856. Oops. So the, sorry. That's all right. So the latter part of the 1800s, they actually decided to keep their own grapes and begin winemaking there. And they were able to, they did that for about 80 years. And then about 1935, a Spanish army general bought the property and decided to just keep it as his own private playground, I guess. Uh, hmm. it, it dropped off the map. It was not used for winemaking that anyone could discern. Or maybe he went back to selling it and just wasn't putting it out there. I don't know, it, it fell off the map until the 1970s. So in the 70s, a new owner came in and uh, the Costell family, and they, they purchased the, uh, the area, they began winemaking and making it an estate grown, and they turned it into all sustainable farming. So they're making sure that they are not taking more from the earth than they're putting back on any given vintage. It's not the exact same thing as, um, as being organic, but it can include organic. They just don't necessarily, it's a different, it's a separate designation. And it usually includes organic, but um, often sustainable can be even more important to the environment than, than organic. So when we say, like, if something is organic, is it across the board, wine in general has the same standards for being certified organic? No. 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 Okay, it's, it is France would designate it or it's the country. That's right. The country okay. will designate what makes it organic. Um, they're generally pretty tough. And mm -hmm. for the most part, which is very difficult, in order to establish your winery as organic, you have to meet their criteria and then skip a vintage and make no money. Oh. And then on the next vintage, so they let it, basically they, they establish, you are now organic and we're going to let it set for an entire year, which means you, you miss all the money making on, on a vintage, mm. and then you can be organic. Mm. So it's kind of brutal. It's, it's yes. a little hard, which is why a lot of people are organic, and especially in France, mm -hmm. almost everyone is sustainable and organic, but they don't officially designate it because they don't oh. want to miss a vintage. Oh, that makes sense. Do you want to stop sharing or go to the next slide? Uh, I can't remember. Let's look at the next slide. Okay. 
Nope, stop sharing. Sure. Okay. So. Don't look at this one. That's right. We'll come back to that. <laughs> so here we are drinking. Uh, I want to talk about a little bit of what's interesting with this. So we're talking about a red wine, red blend from Medoc, which is within Bouge, with, uh, within Burgundy, excuse me, within <laughs> Bordeaux in France. Okay. So there's so many different designations. This is called a Cru Bourgeois. So within, as they, as, as they identify different levels of quality in wine in France. So you first go to a region and a region designates what kind of grapes you can grow. So in, in, um, in Bordeaux, what we're talking about is a red wines that are either Cabernet Sauvignon dominant or Merlot dominant, which is very comfortable for Americans because that's what took over the California wine production. Um, then you go into left bank and right bank. And I showed you earlier the map, left bank is traditionally Cabernet Sauvignon dominant. So because we're drinking a red blend from the left bank of Bordeaux, Traditionally, that would mean it's a Cabernet Sauvignon dominant red blend. That is not what we're drinking. We are drinking a Merlot dominant red blend, which traditionally would be the right bank of, the, uh, of Bordeaux. But what has happened is climate change. Mm -hmm. And because of climate change, they are gaining, um, basically they're having a really hard time getting Cabernet Sauvignon to ripen appropriately for what they want because the warm weather is over-ripening the Cabernet Sauvignon. They're mm -hmm. used to cooler weather. And so in order to, uh, and the Merlot it ripens a little slower. And so um, what they're now finding is that they have to go Merlot. And this is not the only winery. I'm finding this again and again and again. It's actually difficult for me to now find a left bank Bordeaux red blend that is Cabernet Sauvignon dominant. They're all having to switch all already. What's interesting too is this is uh, 2015. So that right. was five years ago. Right, yeah. Well, and, and the other thing too is that we're talking about needing a little bit more time to open up, which goes to show that the French really do make wines to age. We're talking about a $25 bottle of wine that can easily age 10, 10 to 12 years. Because people will often ask me, how much do I have to spend in order to have a wine worth aging? And it's usually around $50 a bottle. Below that, it's not really made to age, it's made to drink. But the French are not that way. So um, this guy at $25 a bottle, obviously not this week because we put it on, on sale, but um, it's a $25 bottle of wine that is worthy of aging and will age beautifully for that amount of time and Jeff? gaining quality and character. Sorry, um, when you were saying like if a grape were to over ripen, are they still gonna use it? And what would that do to the flavor of the wine? That's a good question. Good question. So if it over ripens, they, the French will not use it uh, or they'll sell it out to someone else. So which was realistically, they're going to sell it out to someone else and say, yeah, it's not gonna be representative of my chateau. Um, but basically, when Cabernet Sauvignon becomes overly ripe, you get too many sugars compared to the acid in the balance. And so it just becomes kind of that cheap California general Cabernet Sauvignon that's just flabby and not worthy of the name. I was gonna say, is that when they would just sell it to the Americans or? <laughs> well, there's a lot of um, just um, Cabernet Sauvignon that's labeled from France, you know, and. It, they can come from some amazing areas, but it might have been a year in which they over ripened, and so they're just trying to get some money back on the on the investment. The um, uh, what's kind of interesting. So this guy breaks the rules in that it is a left bank Bordeaux, but it is Merlot dominant, not Cabernet dominant. Um, Cru bourgeois is kind of interesting. So Cru, what does Cru mean? Uh, Cru designation in France, almost always. This is uh, wine, so it can't be simple. And it's French, so it can't be simple. <laughs> <laughs> so cru almost always means a specific geographical area that creates a flavor that you can identify. So it's something identifiable. Uh, they have something to their microclimate combined with their earth, you know, with the earth in that area that creates a specific flavor. And that is true 
almost all the time. And in this case, we're talking about Bordeaux, all right? And then we're talking about Medoc. Medoc is a region, so that's also identifiable. And then we have Cru Bourgeois. Well, what does Cru Bourgeois mean? Cru Bourgeois does not mean what the rest of the crews mean. <laughs> but it is one of the most popular um, designations for really good Bordeaux coming out of there. So Cru Bourgeois was not here. Um, can we pull up the, the, uh, the screen again? Thank you. Yep. And jump back a couple. OK. Jump back a couple. Mm -hmm. Tell me when. Go back, go back to a map. There we no map further. Here we go. Okay, so if you look in this area, this is within the left bank of Bordeaux. You will not see Cru Bourgeois in one of these sub appellations, mm -hmm. right? You'll see Saint Estefan, Hot Medoc, Pouillac, all these areas. Cru Bourgeois is not there. So Cru Bourgeois are not the areas that were originally designated in the 40s and the 30s to be an official crew. So, and then we'll jump back to us, please. Okay. Nope. <laughs> All right. So what they did, Cru Bourgeois is outside of those areas, but within Medoc. And then we saw the exact area in the upper Medoc area. Mm -hmm. What Cru Bourgeois, um, Bourgeois is, is they, 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 these areas that were left out, these different chateaus said, hey, 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 we make fantastic wine. You guys should have included us. And they said, nah. You know, I don't know if we want to do that because we're making money and you can't make as much money as us. And then they kept pushing. And so they actually created it as a designation, not as a geographic area. It's as quality from the left bank Bordeaux within Medoc. So if you were to get, say, one of the St. Estefan, right, which is going to charge a lot of extra money because it's a crew specifically within Medoc within Bordeaux, but they might have had a bad year. They don't have to establish whether or not their wine was good that year. They still get to put the name on there hmm. and it might be a terrible year or maybe they got a new winemaker and he really messed it up. They still get to charge for that. These guys are the guys that are outside of those established realms. They actually have to apply with a sample to Medoc and get approved because their wines are so good. And that goes all the way back to what I hinted at in the beginning, mm -hmm. which is why when you see Cru Bourgeois, you'll get a combination of a great price because it's not one of the traditionally identified crews. And they had to get approval for Cru Bourgeois for quality of wine. And the other guys don't have to apply for a crew approval for quality of wine. Wow. Boom, bam, that's why I chose this guy. <laughs> <laughs> so that brings it back. That's why Cru Bourgeois is an incredibly exciting designation right now out mm -hmm. of Bordeaux because they're delicious wines. They're still traditional. They're reasonably priced and you just get a lot more money for your, you know, a lot more for your money. Bang for your money. Yep. Yeah. So when exactly. you see Cru Bourgeois, you know, it is what it's supposed to be and it's good. Exactly. Somebody, yeah. and, you know, it's a good representation of whatever of the it's area. supposed to be. Yep. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, so Cru Bourgeois is just, it's one of the best deals out there for drinking French red blends. Does this have to happen every year, every vintage? That's they, good, question. Um, good question. Once they are, once they've gotten in once, they have a much easier time, but they do check them out again. And they do have a lot more work to do than the traditional crews. They, they do have to keep up and continue communicating with the Med Doc um, you know, wine uh, like association. Board? It is a board. Okay. Yeah. And so they do, they have a, they have to do a lot more work than the rest of them. And it's oh. just based on geography. They're within Madoc, but they were not identified back in the thirties and the forties. And so they have to continue to prove that they're worth drinking and that it's worth putting on the name Madoc. Huh. Yeah. That's very cool. Well, I thought it was kind of, yeah. Cool. I, yeah. yeah. Mm. I need more. Excuse me, I needed a sip. I'm <laughs> oh, sorry. I got too much into my wine talk. <laughs> so if Kiwi was here, I would ask her about the tannins. So what do you guys think about the tannins? I feel like is that the that what got less obvious, like when we lose the cranberry? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, all right, so I did an experiment. 
So the second glass I poured into one of my wider mouth, you know, open up and it definitely, I didn't aerate this one. Mm -hmm. uh, and it definitely, I don't know, I, I'd say the glass that I chose to pour this in originally was the wrong glass. Oh, okay. Just alone to help it open up, I think is a better thing. So I find that one of my more wine glasses for heavier wines that need to open up, I think might be a better choice for this. So. Yeah, I can see Chris, that. Chris, did yours change at all? Pardon me? Oh, I was asking Chris if his changed at all. Yeah, um, so I um, ended up pouring, and if you saw me fumbling around, uh, I ended up pouring mine to the aerator and kept hers not on the aerator. And um, at first I was like, oh man, this is like a radical change. And I thought mine was like way more like fruity yeah. and like, I thought I actually brought forth the cranberry and stuff like that. As it's kind of gone on, I think they smelled the same. Um, as it's kind of gone on, like... I think they've equaled out. Yeah, yeah they've leveled out a little bit. I still think mine ends up being more pronounced in that fruit and stuff like that. Yeah. So it was, kind of, it was kind of interesting to be like, oh my god, that was a night and day difference between pouring those. Um... Yeah, I feel like um, as it's opened up, the um, the cranberry quality is going away, which I expected, yeah. mm -hmm. and it's becoming much more about cherry and black cherry. And I feel like the tannins are actually inflating. So in the beginning, it was tight and lean with acidity, enhancing the tannins, and they were they were really oh, kind of fine. Of and now mm -hmm. they're fattening up, and so now we have these nice aggressive really? tannins that are large as well, running across the palate. And so I'm finding the wine at this point would be much more appropriate for something like a fattier steak mm -hmm. rather than duck or pork in the beginning. Mm -hmm. So we would tell Myra to wait like 30 minutes before she takes hers. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, un unfortunately, Myra has no idea which version of tan she prefers. <laughs> <laughs> she just likes to talk about I just put that on video, but it's okay. I'll stand, I'll stand by. <laughs> You would own up to that. Yeah. She knows it when she like, and when she when she right. when she knows it, she knows it. That's right. it. Yeah. I mean, I, I I think I'm getting the same thing as you. Like the the second and third glass, my my mouth is a lot drier than the first glass. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's yep. Definitely changing. I, I can I can sense yeah. it. I'm I'm beginning to want to like, click my palate. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. This is this is it's it's becoming more to where it's like wow, I really I really want some food to pair with this as it opens up. This is what the wine is supposed to be. And this is what it will be much faster in three to five years. But it totally gets there. I mean, we haven't been here for four hours. It's, you know, it, it took 30 minutes. It's not yeah. too bad. Yeah. Yeah. Is that what you can drink. Up, what's that, Chris? Oh, I was about to say, we ended up grabbing some like cheese and stuff like that. And just to be like, oh, yeah, we, we do have some like sharp cheeses that we could try to grab real quick mm -hmm. and see if it changes it. I think that also really helped with like how I was perceiving it. Oh, sure. Um, and that really sharp finish I was mentioning earlier really isn't there as much anymore. Mm -hmm. um, it's a lot more of a subtle, like you said, it's still not oaky or vanilla, but it's still right. like, oh, okay, this is, this is nice rather than like, oh yeah, this is, you know, cherry earthy and then like, and then we're done. I was like, mm -hmm. okay. Right. That's a mm -hmm. sure. Yeah, you're right. You it, early on the, the finish comes with time, and it needs to yeah. open up. Mm -hmm. um, and um, which is fine. I mean, it's, you know, we're, as we drink through some, um, at some point, because I've been holding off and jumping all over the world, we'll go to California and drink some nice cab um, as a group, and it will be the exact same thing where it needs to open up. Uh, ideally, if it's a good one. So, um, I mean, you're going to pick a good one, right? So, eh, you know, I, one of these times I'm going to throw a stinker in there just to see if you guys, I'll get you guys to say all these nice things. Then I'll say, no, this wine sucks. I'd lie. <laughs> like, you knew it. Um, <laughs> I was just thinking, Brian will be like, I knew it all along. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> um, the really yummy wine that we got the crazy deal on that my yes. robot have 11. So literally, I we had one bottle with my sister-in-law, and the next time when she came over, we had another bottle. I forgot to put the aerator in, and mm -hmm. she took the, and I hadn't had it yet. I was like serving people, and she took the first sip, and she's like, you forgot to aerate this. 
Whoa. Wow. Like, what is the quality that would be so distinct for that wine? But that wine, it, it does have a lot of time in bottle. I'm going to get it so we know which one we're talking okay. about. Okay. Um, but so the difference you're going to find in there is if you have a really young uptight wine like this, you're going to have a lack of a lack of additional flavors. It's going to be a lot of cranberry and tight tartness. Yes. With an older wine, what you're going to get is more muskiness without the rest of it. So because that, you know, there's some time in bottle, you can get a little bit of a musky quality, but it blows off very quickly. So if you aerate it, it's gone. It's just out of there. Um, and that's most likely what she was seeing. The nice thing about that wine too is even though it's had 11 years in the bottle, it is, um, it yeah. actually has room to take a breath too. And the tannins start out needle-like and then they fatten just like this guy. Where now it's just this, this big aggressive beast was like, oh, there we go. This is, this is the guy I'm talking about right here. Mm -hmm. And I knew it would evolve to it. And I, you know, here we are at the end of the tasting and, and I'm more excited than ever about pouring this additional glass. <laughs> all right, the Browns. I, we haven't heard from you all night. Who? From who? The Browns. Oh, Maria's, Maria's No, no, Marie, Marie we just talked about a little bit ago. Mm -hmm. I did, I did. I was probably distracted. My cat was being really cute and I left for a second, sorry. I had to take, I had to take pictures. Uh, <laughs> all right, so. Um, I had a question actually about the tannins. Would we say this is a high tannin wine? Cause to me, my mouth is like, like I'm literally over here like sucking my teeth. Yes, yes absolutely Rosie, absolutely. This is a high tannin wine. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And I, I was not feeling that at the beginning, but no. now for sure, I just, I keep doing yeah. that same thing too. Right. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. This is, uh, and that's exactly, I, I love that evolution mm -hmm. where you can say, okay, wine changes. And this is a high tannin wine. You could, you could drink this wine with the, any cut of steak you want. It mm -hmm. is fantastic. And it, it, it is. Um, so those high tannins, when you drink that with, with steak or, any kind of like a more fatty meal that cleans your palate so that what you're tasting is fresh every single time, in addition to blending with the oh, flavors. Is that, why? that is one of the reasons it's paired. Okay. Yep. I, I and, did have one question. How do you feel this will mature? What will it be like in uh, like 20, 23. 23 or something? Yeah, 20, in, in 2023, it's going to be like this, but faster. Oh. <laughs> so you'll just skip the other part of it. And it may go into a little bit more of a, you may get a little bit of a plum, a black plum quality. You know, you'll get a, maybe a little more depth than the fruit, but the bottom line is mostly what you'll see is it will get to this point right out of the glass. Or excuse me, right out of the bottle. Do, do you guys keep like a journal so that you know what it tastes like in 2020 and then compare it to 2023? I'm not sure I'm gonna remember that in three years. <laughs> what was that tonight? <laughs> <laughs> sure, I'm gonna be that good. Do you guys keep a journal or anything? Or we don't. I, I would love it if I could drink all my wines every year as they mature, the ones that are supposed to. But um, it's more of you learn the style um, and how it behaves over time as you drink more. Mm -hmm. So you'll have one of these, and then maybe you'll save one, and then you'll taste it, or maybe oh, you, yeah. you buy the um, the um, no. Or by the um, the Geo, no, no. Um, what's the one we were just showing? The Creo. The Creo, thank you. Um, or you buy the Creo, and you kind of begin to see, you, you begin to taste what that evolution tastes like, and you do that one or two times, and you just you can kind of make the mental connection as you go forward. Okay. You make the mental connection. We're gonna write it down. I don't. Let's, let's say you're a classy wine collector like Mr. Hogsett and you're going, you collect all these delicious wines and they say like, oh my gosh, this wine's going to peak in 2023. Well, this wine's going to peak in 2025. Do people put like post-its on their wine? Like how do you classily know when to try your wines? Oh, well, you can, you can definitely look at it. Um, as you drink wine, there will be part of it where you can just you'll decide on your own, okay, I want this guy to have 10 years in the bottle because it's X style, you know, and as you learn more about it, or you can ask us, but we're happy no, to no. How do you keep track of that? I think. Oh, I would just write on it. I would, you know, just write on, yeah, on, would, on the uh, bottle. Yeah. I would say, look, I want to drink this. Um, here, here's. So like with a paint pen or 
or like metallic sharpie. Uh, right, a, a metallic just, sharpie. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And yeah. one of my favorite things <laughs> is um, my one of my favorite customers in the store, Bob Mitchell. Mm -hmm. um, comes in what he does is he buys if he likes a wine he'll buy a case and then he will he will look at it and, and decide ahead of time or we'll talk about it and say okay this will optimize between x date and x date so let's say 2023 and 2028 and he will open one in 2023 but he'll have 12 of them mm -hmm. so he will open one and see what he thinks maybe drink two that year mm -hmm. and then two the next year mm -hmm. and then drink through the cycle and that's kind of that, that enophile process for people that will work through a wine that they truly love and have worked through the whole, the whole wow. experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's awesome. It's, it's really cool. It's really, really cool when he brings one in. <laughs> yeah. But well, you got a wine. Dig a hole. Because you've got to let it sit and you've got to aerate it and it develops over a 30 minute period or so. But if the wine is, in the box another five years just like you want it when it comes out of the bottle right get, exactly jerry yeah you kind of get used to that well this this has a bottom to it that tells you that it's relatively young i don't know how to explain it but it's a relatively young wine and it, uh, give it 30 minutes or so or aerate it and add the oxygen to the uh to the wine and it it tones up real That's good but in five years it'll be like that out of the bottle wow. mm -hmm. right uh, get used to that subconsciously, I think. Yep. Is there, Thanks, is there like, a, like a wine advocate type uh, app? Like there is the, the beer, like what's, what's that beer app called? Sure. Where you put notes and stuff in it. Je Jeff, oh, have you ever used Cellar oh, Tracker? There, um, basically, yeah, there's their Cellar Tracker and there are a couple of different places like Wine Spectator and Wine Enthusiast mm -hmm. tend to put out, they put out a thing every year. Um, and I think there's even an app version that, um, We'll go through different wines in different locations and give you a general time frame. General time frame <laughs> um, uh, that uh, that it tells you. Okay, if you buy this, you should give it X number of years. You know, some of it is drink immediately, and some of it is give it five years, ten years, that kind of a thing. And we, you know, we're here to help out too. So. So, so one thing that I like about using Seller Tracker, and we've been kind of lackadaisical using it lately. Is that when you so you use you can either you you can either donate money to Seller Tracker or you can use it for free. So you set up an account. When you have a free account, they'll let you store so many wines. But then you can um, sort through your wines by what needs to be drank. Mm, so it'll nice. pop everything nice. up to the top, looking depending on what you know the vintage is and and what is suggested through Wine Spectator and through the other wine enthusiasts of when it should be drank. So that's a nice way to store your wines too. Right. That is because yeah. then you, you don't know end up do having stuff. something get too old and yeah. you know, yeah. it would have right. been great five years ago, but you didn't drink it and now it's not great. Anymore. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, what's like interesting to put, too, like to put is, a purchase um, date online. Yeah. Yeah. Purchase date right on the bottom of the bottle. Nice. The what is, what will happen to a wine? I know we were talking yeah. about that last week a little bit with that wine that Myra's dad gave you but like oh, what right. will happen to a wine if you overage it if you overage a wine it, it will it will jump the shark i mean it, it will come to a point where i'm so i'm so glad people still know who fonzie is <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm so old. but um it, it will come to a point where it will have too much oxygen enter the bottle and it will over oxidize and just turn into this vinegar cardboard experience and it will go bad I and mean, that, that happens even the good bottles of wine they're not it's not forever you you really want to hit it at its peak um i've had a couple of uh bottles of wine really expensive bottles of wine that were eh, two to three years after and you would drink it and you say okay but then what happens is the tannins just fall off and they become flabby and the finish is just kind of a flabby juiciness and it's it's not it's not what you wanted. It's not disgusting, but it's it's not what it could have been. Mm -hmm. It loses life, if you will, yeah. and you can taste it. Like when you taste one, you taste it's just it's just flabby, weak. lifeless. Will come yeah. to mind. Yeah. Like <laughs> it been so good. Kind of bland. Unlike a corks bottle, will you'll know right away it needs to be dumped down the drain. Yeah. 
We did that Saturday night at a friend's house. He pulled out a bottle of wine that was not inexpensive, and we all knew right away it needed to be dumped. Yeah. So we have bad. dumped a couple down the drain. Yeah, we have. Mm -hmm. It happens. It does. I mean, it's, it's can't do much with it, right? It's, you know, wine is a living organism, kind of mm -hmm. in the bottle, and it's um, that's kind of yeah. part of the fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's no exact science, and we all are working around the best parts of it. And when you hit those gems, that's what's so exciting. Where you say, oh, I nailed it. Oh, it was so good. <laughs> wow. But uh, this guy, you know what other thing that, that I love about this wine is, this is Merlot dominant, but we're talking about intense tannins. And yeah, most yeah. people think of Merlot, like, this is the age of the recovery of Merlot. <laughs> because after, poor Merlot. After the movie. So fine <laughs> after Sideways. Right. Um, Merlot can have tannins. <laughs> this is dominantly Merlot, and it has great tannins. And it's not like the cab is making up for weak Merlot. They're both strong. And some of my wines that I have in the store in the Merlot section that are my favorite, I call them cab drinkers Merlot because they have this big, rich plumminess, but they have good structure. And it can totally happen with cool growth Merlot. And that's what we're talking about here tonight. This is not a wimpy wine, mm -hmm. and it is dominantly mm -hmm. Merlot. Um, inside, yeah. oh, sorry. did they do that because like California Merlots were terrible at the time? Merlot had gone crazy, and they were over oaking with new oak with um, warm growth Merlot. Mm -hmm. And it was a flabby vanilla. It was specifically California. Uh, yes, it Merlot's was. Not. But it was also, have you heard about like the explanation of the characters? Have you heard the director's explanation? Oh, you have to go read it. It's fascinating. Okay, I'll have to do that. They each character in the movie represents a different kind of wine. Different kind of wine. Really? Oh, really? Yep. Oh, okay. Oh. You definitely have to read that. And I, I need to watch. I need to read the description and then watch it. Yeah, again. it was a great movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's, um, exactly. let's jump over to the last slide. Yeah, okay. All right. So, I know you guys have seen it. Let me think if anyone has not. No, so we're going to go through these a little bit quickly. Nope, hold oh. on. <laughs> Hit the wrong thing there, almost kicked there everyone out. <laughs> How's the, uh, so Tell on. me when. Go, go. Then All right, so ratings. So, like, we have, what do we have here tonight? We have a 91 and an 88. So, mm -hmm. um, that goes, I, you know, I just wanted to point out my, you know, the, the wine score explanation again. We have a combination of outstanding and very good with special qualities. Um, they also disagree on the best time to drink them because the 88 said drink it now. Okay. And the, the 91 said drink in 2023. So you've got to average that out to we're right in the zone. Okay. And I think it, look, within 30 minutes of opening without, I didn't even decant this, mm -hmm. that counts as ready to drink. Yeah. But by 2023, it'll be open the bottle and it will taste just like this. Yes, nice and yeah, that's right. right. In 2023, yeah. it'll be like this within a minute. Okay. Yeah, I'm tempted to just take our second bottle and stash it. There you go. There you go. Yeah. Next slide. Yes. I had that much self control. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's all right. We have choices in this house. That's all I can say. Um, this was everyone here has been here, seen my whole thing about points and how they can change back and forth with the 94 versus 83 on the same vintage. So I'm going to skip it this week because there's nobody new. So I thought when I first saw this come up, oh, this is what we're drinking next week. So we'll know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I still do that. Um, no, no. <laughs> of course, I don't want to. Yeah. I don't want to have a whole tasting of chicken pot. That no, yeah, right. that, I'm not doing that. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here we are with the uh, growing latitudes. So um, we have. Doo -doo -doo, let me go up here. So we're going to France. Yeah. This is that. right about here. Mm -hmm. Yep. So right it's now. right kind of in the middle of there. But it is so moist, I'm thinking, is the, the issue. But it's not hot. If, I guess that if it was hot and moist, they probably couldn't handle it. But uh, that's, uh, that's where we're growing, which goes way over here. We should probably buy some Maine wine, maybe. I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> See, to me, it looks like it's more like, well, maybe Maine. Maybe Oops. Canada, too. Okay. okay. Oh, well, is, I move forward. Ooh, one hill. Oh, yes. Okay, everybody. Oh. 
Oh, yes. This is a brand new product from Wan Hill. Really? Yes. Man, I don't man. know if you guys have ever had the Wan Hill Silver or the Wan Hill Blue from Monastrell. They are some of the best buys in the store. They're absolutely delicious. Big, lush, but with character. This is a brand new. I'm going to lift this one up. This is a brand new red blend from the same vineyards. Monastrell, Syrah, and Cab Sauv. Nice. Um, there, there are no ratings. This is the very first vintage from, of this wine. It's only going to nine states in the United States, and it is a limited release. I've grabbed three cases. Right. I don't know if I'm going to get any more, but this is the, the beautiful, beautiful beast that we will drink next week. Oh, my gosh. I'm looking forward to this one. Me too. Oh, I'm so. Because I've had the silver and the blue. I, I'm yeah, like, yeah. The silver and the blue are so good. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you guys right now, you know, I don't jump on a lot of things until I taste them. I bought this untasted. Whoa. His stuff is amazing. So next yeah. Tuesday will be your first time tasting it as well. Well, unless I jump the gun early. Okay, uh, unless we have it over the weekend. No, you know what? I will wait. <laughs> we'll all drink it together. <laughs> I will wait. <laughs> So spare ribs, bison burgers, barbecue, sharp cheeses, oh, olives, nice. hearty stew, and mushrooms. We need to have a chef at our house for Tuesdays because neither one of us gets cooked for Tuesdays since we're, sure. doing, yeah, doing, we're, we're getting ready for tasting and everything. So I see all these things that should be paired with it and often we don't get to. That's true. Mm -hmm. That would be wonderful. <laughs> anyway, I, this, I was excited here. about this wine. I really wanted to drink. I think Cru Bourgeois is an incredible buy and a great strong wine you know you want something with some real grip um you know it, cool. jump into cru bourgeois because honestly for this guy in the in the quality of tannins that we're getting here you'd have to be in the 40 dollars range out of california mm -hmm. yeah so when you you know with the the complexity and the tannins and you're talking about 25 dollars out of the people that originated it i mean these are the people they could not believe Americans were making single varietal reds. <laughs> what are you doing? Cabernet Sauvignon alone? <laughs> Troglodytes, you know? Uh, so um, anyway, I think, it's, I think it's something that's well worth investigating and enjoying. Um, I have several in the store. I think this guy's fantastic. Thank you all for coming. Uh, any other uh, last thoughts before we stop recording and then just... Really get real. <laughs> Where'd you say this next wine is from? Spain, Jumia. It's Spain, okay. Yep. Oh, another one of those. Huh? Oh, yes. Oh, We're yeah. coming back oh, to oh. España. <clears throat> que bueno. I'm <laughs> liking these European wines. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. I guess at some point I should probably drink a Californian cab, but. <laughs> we did a Californian Who wine. Who has the energy? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. for Hey, I like those California cabs. <laughs> yeah, no, they're good. Yeah, no, no, they're I'll find one that's interesting and worth uh, worth investigating. So. Mm -hmm. Worth revisiting. Yeah. Well, we're thinking about I mean, there, there are a lot of there, the problem with the California cabs is not a problem. The problem is that there's so many good ones. And so it's trying. You know, I got to find one that tells a story that's interesting enough that will be intriguing. Mm. I, I think the thing is for the tastings, you try and find something a little out of the box, I do. a little more interesting. Yep. Mm -hmm. I'm going to Antarctica in a couple of weeks right. to uh, figure out some wines Are from you? there. Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah, you have fun. I'm not going to. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just gonna be cooler Florida. there. Cool, yeah. <laughs> hey, speaking of tired, oh, well, anyway, we'll, we'll sign up. Let's do a toast. Wait, Mary, you had a question. Right. Like, oh, wait, okay. Who's got a question? Oh. Well, I didn't True. have a question. I'm thinking about spare ribs next week. Are you All right. Right. Oh, yeah, there you go. All right. Yes. Man, yeah, that would be yeah. fantastic. Mm -hmm. Great. All, All right. right, let's so do a toast, toast and, and then we'll uh, stop recording and keep talking. Thank All you, right. everyone. Pacha, thank you, guys. All right, cheers, y'all.